All right, here we are. The end of July, the 30th, on the um, week 12 of our 16-week conference. We've saved some of our best presenters for last, um, as you'll see. Uh, David is certainly one of them. Can you get your screen turned on, David? Looks like we can't see you yet, but I'll just keep talking for a second. Oh, there you are. Beautiful. Cool. Um, really happy to uh, to welcome everyone uh, to a meeting with David Knaus. I think he's one of those people who um, really should be more well known than he is. Um, I think he's been keeping a fairly low profile. He got a lot of things accomplished, but I'm not sure how much of his background he'll go into. Hopefully, a decent amount. He's um, been doing quite quite amazing work out in the West Coast um, uh, with Apical Ag, and I think he has some news to share with us today about a service that'll be being launched effectively right about now, which I think will be really powerful in this nutrient density um, <clears throat> process and conversation. So without any further ado, I'll just let you take it away, David. Thanks, Dan. Just wanna make sure everybody can hear me, give me the thumbs up if that's we're working. Okay, all right. Well, th thanks again, Dan, for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, Really excited to, I'd have never been to a um, Dan Nutrient conference. Uh, always wanted to go. I uh, was never able to actually join. And uh, due to other commitments and it being scheduled often, right, juxtaposed to the Acres conference. Um, so anyway, really excited to be here. Uh, have a lot to share. Actually, want to do a deep dive. So um, I think you need to put your snorkels away and just get your your regular old diving gear on today um, because we're probably going to get into some significantly uh, complex agronomic topics and how it relates to the quality of food uh, and overall lifestyle choices for people um, based upon that food. And so um, without further ado, I really want to uh, delve into a lot of what we do at Apical and we'll go from there. So um, the title of the presentation today is called Unlocking Nutrient Density Through the New Paradigm of Crop Nutrition. I'm David Knauss and President and Founder of Apical Crop Science. So a little bit about my background and how I got to be here. Um, so from the time I was born, essentially, and even really before I was born, um, my mom was extremely into organic agriculture. And so this translated into me having a lot of uh, formational experiences when I was young. Um, you know, rabbit manure, uh, fish bones from, from the grocery store, uh, digging trenches, um, uh, you know, sloughing in the mud, uh, harvesting peas, harvesting raspberries, um, etc. And while we didn't have a large farm, we did have a small roadside stand and we sold produce when we could. Um, for the remainder of the produce, we actually ate a lot of it. And we did a lot of fairly subsistence agriculture. Um, we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. And um, my mom was very uh, into natural living and organic agriculture. And so she instilled that in with me in, into me as from a very young age. Um, uh, in the mid nineties, I actually did a fair amount of, uh, of organic lawn care, believe it or not, which is something a lot of people don't really know um, that I did. And and strangely enough, the the organic lawn care um, later on in life uh, came back to me in a number of different ways, uh, managing um, certain other parts of uh, perennial crops, um, uh, managing turf, uh, teaching about turf in horticulture school and so forth later on in, uh, in my career. Um, throughout the early late, to, late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, I did a lot of work um, around vineyards and breweries and uh, nurseries and so forth. Um, and then I spent about 10 years after that, I spent about 10 years uh, market farming for profit, um, greenhouses uh, on scale, you know, six, 10, 10 12, 15 acres uh, of uh, market farm veggies, um, year round season extended stuff um, uh, for chefs all around, uh, all around the Portland metro area and beyond uh, high dollar value crops um, and so forth. And, and that really earned me a reputation within the local community. And next thing you know, I was getting hired by Washington State University Extension to uh, to teach a number of different training programs through Washington State. Um, that continued for a handful of years um, until 2013. That's really when I got my first um, formal university level agricultural uh, teaching position. And so I taught college for the better part of um, 
really 10 years between community college extension and university, um, but really university for about seven years. Um, along that way, uh, during the summer times, during when I was teaching, I would do a, a lot of crop consulting and crop advising um, through in the summertime. And so from 2014 to present, I have been a certified crop advisor and pesticide consultant. Um, and in 2017, I founded Apical Crop Science in its form that it is today as a full service lab, agronomy and consulting service for growers wishing to do organic and or regenerative agriculture. And so Apical Crop Science is, uh, is, is the company that I started and we're based here on the West Coast. Uh, we've got about 12 employees and um, that ebbs and flows, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the season and the year. Um, we are focused a lot in specialty crops, but believe it or not, we actually do extend into horticulture, forestry and so forth. Um, our main claim to fame and one of the things that has propelled us into uh, being uh, somewhat of a leader in regenerative agriculture is uh, we were one of the first uh, labs in North America to do leaf sap analysis. And so some of you folks that may have heard of leaf sap analysis as a technology from European counterparts in European labs or labs in Australia or South America or South Africa rather. Um, anyway, we were one of the first in North America to do it. And um, so we started with leaf sap analysis. We continued into our investigation through really going in a deep dive on soils, which I'll get to more in a moment. Um, and we've continued to uh, expand our, our offerings into step input analysis of fertilizers and biologicals, as well as crop nutritional analysis. And this is something I'll touch on later in the, in the presentation, but essentially the crop nutritional analysis that we're beginning to offer is a uh, mineral assessment uh, with a handful of other key uh, nutrients that growers can access uh, in a low cost way so that they can understand the mineral contribution that their crops are making to public health. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk more about that towards the end of the presentation. I want to understand, I want the rest of the audience to understand how I got there and how we got there as a team and how we can all get there together as an industry or a country or what have you. So um, our entire business model rests upon taking laboratory analysis, using data science to make detailed recommendations and then providing crop inputs that service those recommendations. And we do soil corrections, fertigation scheduling, foliar sprays, microbes, dry organic fertilizers, liquid and organic and regenerative fertilizers, carbon sources, microbiologicals, biostimulants, biopesticides, all from our warehouse here in Oregon. Uh, we ship all across the country and we have an online store that services a uh, small pack across the, across the states. Just a second, David. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure, but you haven't uh, shared your screen yet. I'm not sure if you. Oh, have okay. I was sure. wondering. If you just go doing back and uh, intro first, do... and then. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for thanks for the interruption, Dan. <laughs> I appreciate that. Let me get make sure that my screen is shared. Okay. There we go. Can you guys see it now? Okay. Yep, Sorry, yep. we'll go back to the beginning. And is that better? Can yep, everyone see it? Perfect. Perfect. You can see it. Yep. Great. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, I could see my presentation, but you guys couldn't. So um I'll go back through the first couple of slides here for, for you to take a look. Um so anyway, this was uh when I was describing some of the, the background uh, and my personal history of uh, work and how I've come to understand regenerative and organic agriculture in the way that I do. And this is a little bit more about our company, like I was mentioning and going through here just a second ago. And here's where we are in the presentation. And so what you're seeing there on the right-hand side of the screen is uh, they're actually real life samples that people send in. Um, those are samples that we processed a number of years ago um, that looks like that at our at our office just about every morning and people sending in leaf samples uh, for us to um, essentially extract and analyze and provide detailed recommendations for. Um, so anyway, the using all of this data from that we've accumulated over the course of the last 10 years and using the biofeedback that we've uh, experienced from watching the plants in the field, working with them on a day-to-day -day basis in our local community, um, we use this, we leverage this to use precision crop nutrition and 
What this then does is it helps growers to manage risk or to gain diverse crop responses. Uh, they helps them to avoid in pitfalls, manage inputs better, um, to learn new application techniques and so on and so forth. And so all of this is essentially an integrated system towards regenerative agriculture from to take growers from a situation like you're seeing on the screen now, maybe not super healthy, um, maybe a little bit um, worn down by conventional agriculture, and then transition it into a uh, more vibrant future for that particular farmer or grower. So in the past, one of the things that led me to start the laboratory that we have today was um, a number of years ago, I had some relatively unsatisfactory experiences using other labs and following their recommendations and not having the, the appropriate crop response that I had hoped for or feel like I wasted money um, on using those crop inputs um, or maybe the crop inputs didn't really um, you know, live up to their their marketing scheme or what have you. And so I started this investigation, you know, years and years ago, 15, 16 years ago, while I was still a professional farmer, um, into why non-organic outcomes are are the norm, why organic outcomes are are difficult to to um, to elucidate from or you know to elicit from different crop environments. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so eventually I came upon this research method of plant sap and that uh, started a portable method of exploration and eventually we started the, the brick and mortar. Um, currently we consult on farms, vineyards and orchards across the Western hemisphere and uh, speak and educate on a range of agricultural topics. And we consult and conduct research and development on improving agricultural technologies and methods Moving forward into the future, um, we really are interested in, in enhancing horticulture and forestry industries as well, uh, supporting American farmers and growing apical into a progressive leader in world agriculture. Um, but I want to digress here for a minute because all of these, you know, a lot of times we think about it regenerative agriculture that it's so pastoral and exciting and that things are, um, uh, you know, idyllic, idyllic or um, um, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing or what have you. And, and oftentimes that's true, but real, the reality of the situation and from a, from a crop advisor that, that deals with growers all across the country and outside the country and in a lot of different crops and a lot of different growing environments and situations, I will tell you right now that we are very, very far from nutrient density. Um, so far that it's, um, it's scary, frankly. And so part of the reason why we do what we do is to help growers even understand that there is a better way, that there are options, and that they can access with a relatively risk-free way crop improvement. And so when I talk to growers across the country, we see, see all these terms on the left-hand side. The ground is used up. The ground is tied up. It's wore out. It's tired. It's locked out. It's got red dirt so on and so forth. And so what we did for a number of years was we analyzed what those soils were were, were um, telling us from a data perspective. And that data then allowed us greater insights into what we would find later in the plant. So we were looking at this feedback from the plant to the soil, to the data, to the crop performance, to the grower and back. And so this happened for a number of years until we started to, to see that there was significant correlations between when growers would say a slang term like the ones on the left, they would have actual legitimate data sets that would correlate with that. And we, we developed long-term cumulative data sets that would say, okay, well, when somebody has red dirt or when somebody said has hill ground or somebody says they can't grow nothing in that field, right? This is what we're actually seeing from a data perspective. And so this launched into just longer, deeper explorations into agronomy, regenerative um, crop inputs, how everything starts to come together. And that's really what we're focused on today. And so once we realized that the data was, was not where it needed to be, we needed to collect more data. Let's start this lab and move things forward stemwise. And so over time, what we've learned is that, yes, we need more data, and here's how it comes. And so if we're looking for cellular mineral nutrition, there's nothing better on the market today than understanding leaf sap. If you're looking for soil mineral, mineral availability, we understood now 
that there's many different soil analysis methods and each one of those correspond to one type of soil analysis or more. And so, but if we only look at reams testing or if we only look at Malik 3 or if we only look at water soluble or if we only look at early Albrecht or middle Albrecht or what have you, we're gonna be missing a lot more of the, the picture. And I'll go into that more in detail here shortly. But really, the big thing that, that a lot of these soils are missing is carbon. And all of you folks that are like Dan that have uh, grown up in organics, it's baked into the system. Organic means carbon. And so when you're applying organic fertilizer, you have this system that's already set up to bring carbon in, right? Versus guys that want to do regenerative, ah, they've got to figure out a different way to get carbon into the system, okay? Anyway, there's carbon, and we looked at a number of different forms that the carbon was in, active, inactive, loss on ignition, particulate organic matter, right? And so now we're realizing that, holy cow, there's just loads and loads of data points that no one's looking at. It's affecting all of us. We got to get to the bottom of this, maybe not necessarily the complete bottom, but deeper into this in order to really do our job and, and provide my students or my customers that I had at the time with appropriate information that they needed to answer their questions, right? I would get asked really hard questions as a professor about regenerative agriculture. Well, why isn't it the, the norm? That's a really, really, really good question, right? So you have to think about these things for a while and then start to come up with answers. And so anyway, uh, long story short, as we deep, dig deeper into the data, pathway emerges to take us from where we are today to something that's a little bit better. And so the general workflow is to inform educate and implement the regenerative organics stepwise through apical. And when we set up the lab, um, we did it with the cooperation of a number of PhDs, and some of whom were extraordinarily dedicated to the American Society of Agronomy and their baseline for recommending nutrients to in crops, right source, right rate, right time, right place. Okay, yeah, sure, everybody gets this. However, when fertilization is implemented, is how do we even know that this is actually proper, right? We don't, don't necessarily even know this in a lot of cases because we're not tracking it. And so is this going to be regenerate or degenerate the plants, the self, the plant, the soil, or the consumer health? Okay, so we're really starting to dig deep into how do we actually understand what's happening and so on and so forth. And so we came up with this sort of a verification principle behind R, the four R working or not. And so if you're regenerating the soil, if you have resilient crops, if you can create repl replicable results, and you, if you can create reviewable uh, uh, research projects, now that actually means the four R's are working. But if the four R's are really not working, you might try retry for profits next year, you might have to replant a different variety, you might have to remove the entire crop from growing, or if in, in the worst case, you just might retire. Um, and I've seen all of these situations happen to growers, um, some of whom I was very personally connected to through a, through a friendship or, or business relationship. Um, or I've also seen it happen uh, food growers that really wanted to get into agriculture and had a lot of enthusiasm about it, but they couldn't quite make the four R's work for themselves. And so I truly believe that the four R's are sound, but they're not detailed enough in order to get us where we want to go. And so our basic workflow in the lab is we run an analysis, we make a data-driven recommendation, and then we do an application. But each one of those is slightly nuanced because oftentimes we're looking at the leaf and we're looking at the leaf and we're saying, okay, well, we didn't do as good enough job as we as we did, as we could have in, in soil analysis. And so we need to go back three steps and we need to, to, to get back on track. And so throughout this process, um, we're running things in a replicable way in the lab, why not develop a replicable protocol for actually accessing and repeating results in the field? And so that's what we eventually did was we, we developed a 10 step method for growers to implement, compare, implement comparison sampling, a number of things. We call this the apical method of crop improvement and it's available on our website. But what it's all boiled down to, what it boils down to is improving plant health by balancing nutrients in season. And there's three key, four key reasons that we do this, in fact. One, plants always strive to obtain balance of mineral levels between their new leaves and old leaves. So when we were starting the lab, 
we found when we analyzed plants that nature was growing that were independent of agronomic environments, we found that they were incredibly balanced from new leaf to old leaf, always within a 10% gradient. Once we found that, we, we could then use that information to create new data sets of desired ratios and desired elements and desired ranges and so on and so forth. But those imbalances that plants often experience in an agronomic environment increases plant stress. And this is a topic I'll go deep into here in a, in a few minutes later on in the presentation. Plant stress emerged and have emerged throughout the entire globe right now as a key layer of plant and horticultural science. And it's a little bit more qualitative than it is quantitative, but that nonetheless, this is the realm that a lot of folks are trying to address when they're dealing with biostimulants, microbiologicals, and so forth. But if we're not actually cognizant of where well, the realm that we're, that we're operating in, we're liable to end up in a place we don't know where we're going. And so by using proper analysis to guide the biostimulants, now we can have a, a new opportunity and a new way of interacting with plants. And so when stress slows, or when stress increases, photosynthesis slows. Slower, fo slower photosynthesis decreases yield, sugar, sugar production, protein production, so on and so forth. A lot of this is pretty basic court science that you can learn from a lot of other agronomists in the industry. And this is another sort of situation where you can learn from a lot of other textbooks and so on and so forth, right? So you can, okay, I'm going to go out on my farm. I'm going to take a look at the field and I'm going to say, all right, well, I got this misshapen leaf in the top. Maybe it's a calcium deficiency and I got this yellow leaf on the bottom. Maybe that's a nitrogen deficiency, but really I don't know. And a lot of it may be guessing. And so furthermore, now we've got our Mulder's chart where we're looking at nutrient antagonism and nutrient interaction. And oh, well, now we're gonna make some even bigger guesses with a lot more complexity. And so when I was looking at, at this, you know, 10, 12 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, I, I my, my brain just kind of exploded. And I said, you know, this looks like a, you know, sort of a dream catcher, right? And so you're kind of lucky if, if you catch your dream in this situation and a lot of times folks are not getting what they want they're not getting the the yield the vigor the the nutrient value the the sugar production any of these things from the crop and so having experienced acutely crop failures uh, from from poor nutrition myself as a grower and then also extreme crop successes from from proper nutrition i was in a reasonable place to say all right let's develop some new tools right so if we have our lab we've got PhDs on staff that can help us, and we've got a, a, a large and accumulating data set. Well, what we eventually did is we created what we sort of refer to as our um, user interface for nutrient management of plants. And so we have an online database where all of our leaf and soil analysis are stored, where you can compare and contrast different data, data sets with one another, or you can compare the data set to itself. Um, new leaf to old leaf, or you can compare your data set to all the other data sets that we've accumulated for that particular crop over time, um, and so on. And so what we end up with is a very large data science heavy agronomic entity. I know that's a lot to sort of grasp for a second here, um, but when we really understood what was happening in the field, it was uh, a real tragedy because fertilization is often a lot of guesswork currently. Carbon deficiencies are a common cause of nutrient excesses. Um, nutrient excesses lead to cascading problems with growers. Uh, leaf sap analysis can identify easily nutrient deficiencies though. And you can also use this, this type of technique to identify the efficacy of various crop inputs. You can compare certain growing conditions, healthy, sick, weak, strong, insect presence or absence, et cetera, and do it all in real time. So if you can then take more accurate fertilization, lower stress levels, now you can access better crop performance. And so this is the system that we've been, uh, that's, that we've been developing for 10 years. And so after analyzing leaf sap analysis from 2017 until about 2019, we were receiving repeat questions around surrounding soil health and how it related to leaf sap analysis from growers that we were working with. And 
So we did a deep dive into um, uh, academic literature and we really started to understand, we wanted, I personally wanted to understand what is soil. Right. I didn't I didn't want to guess anymore. I didn't really want to the, the stock answers or what have you. I really wanted to break down what is that stuff that we're all standing on. And so if you look at the right hand side, that's actually a pretty decent breakdown of what you get in soil. You've got water, you got air. Uh, but then the other thing that, that we get into here is we've got silicon. We've got aluminum, we've got iron in huge levels, right? And this is something I, that always bothered me about, um, you know, ball bracket mineral tests or mainly like three type soil balancing is um, you would sometimes see really high levels of iron on the test or really high levels of silicon or aluminum, but it just wasn't addressed. It was just kind of said, oh, don't worry about that. It's not affecting the plant. Well, when we started looking at plant sap, we found that the aluminum was making it into the plant. And in fact, silicon, when we looked into research in modern, into modern biostimulants, was hugely important into plant growth and development. And so now we're saying to ourselves, well, hey, this is not this, none of this makes sense. We're looking at very small fractions of the soil and expecting to get a clear picture of what we should do in the field and how we can actually go about eliciting good results from the field itself in an agronomic way, well, this, something doesn't line up. And so if you actually look at the bottom half of this, if the chart on the right-hand side, calcium, mag, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, well, those are the key elements that we're typically used to thinking about with the exception of maybe carbon. But what if that's less than 50% or, or less than 20% really of, of the soil itself? You don't think that we should be looking at the other 80%, right? And so, what we found was that if we actually look through environmental analysis, the different methods and, and, and uh, key players throughout organic and regenerative agriculture through the, um, through the history of the last 100 years or so, you know, Kerry Reams, William Albrecht, they were doing good work, but it just wasn't the complete picture. But when you take Reams, put it together with Albrecht, then add your sap paste, and then you add total digest soil analysis, now all of a sudden, the soil actually does make sense. And there's there's hardcore equations that can be developed from silicate bicarbonate reactions or silicate phosphate reactions or aluminal phosphate reactions, luminosilicate reactions, and so on and so forth. They're a little bit more complex than, say, your CEC balancing, but nonetheless extremely important in growing crops. Additionally, there's this whole layer of carbon and how it relates to anion exchange. Anion exchange... Most people don't even really talk about it, right? We only talk, ever hear about CEC, cation exchange. Well, so one day I kept getting questions from growers saying, well, what about anion exchange? Can you tell me more about this? And I didn't really have good answers. And so I had to do everything I could to understand anion exchange as well. What I learned was that carbon is your key anion and it affects all the other anions on the anion side. And if you don't have carbon, you typically don't have anion exchange. That's a big problem. So you don't have, you can't control the amount of phosphate, nitrate, silicate, carbonate, fluoride, iodine, and so on and so forth, and how that's going to get into your plant if you don't have carbon in your soil, or to the extent you don't have it, you can't get those into the plant. Anyway, so I know that this isn't an entirely agronomic um, uh, audience, and so I'm going to skip through the remainder of this. But the bottom line is, is that we learned huge things about deep soil, or about soils from our deep soil analytics. And this is an example of one of our tests where we're actually going through and we're looking at large data sets, four different extraction protocols, combining the data and then building recommendations from those. There's a lot that's missing in your typical soil analysis that most growers are doing, and it's affecting the health vibrancy all of us today okay so moving on from soil analysis because i'm very passionate about plant and soil analysis so if i get if i act a little upset it's because i i get very um uh, worked up because of how um how many problems there are and how avoidable the problems are in in modern agriculture so anyway um moving on uh, water analysis was something that we started to look at and the more we looked at it, the more we realized that there's nutrients that we can access in 
the in in the water a lot oftentimes if we uh, perform different types of water buffering strategies um, we also learned that that water oftentimes has huge contaminants that you can't even uh, fathom how bad they're affecting the crops and so we we found you know dozens of growers in in a handful of different bioregions that were all being affected by similar problems high sodium high chloride high nitrate high potassium high magnesium in certain cases, high iron, iron bacteria, iron or aluminum, et cetera, all in the water. And so it's a slow feed poison to the quant all day long, every single day. So most irrigation water is contaminated. Rainwater has really beneficial properties and that water contamination is often being overlooked. How much is this affecting the food that we eat? Astronomically, it's just, it's, it's beyond understanding. And so once we finally had accumulated these three basic techniques that we felt were extremely powerful and had relevance to the growers, um, we built a grower interface profile that allows growers to compare and contrast and allows you to track the, the incoming field and, and geotag it up upon a uh, on a mapping system. So for you so you can geotag a weather or other types of geospatial data to it. Um, we've you can also chart uh, one test to another. You can compare and contrast uh, individual reports. You can track nutrients over time. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with the data science feature features upon our website. So this nutrient management interface was then used or is, is, is in use daily across the board with ourselves and all the customers that we work with, excuse me, to provide diagnostics data science and prop line feedback. So our detailed recommendations then allow growers to compare the, the, the plant response from, from, from one type of crop treatment to another. And so now what we've done is we've basically decentralized the ability for growers to conduct on-farm research. And so I don't, that's not, I don't really want to understate that because if you're a grower and you've got, you know, 10, uh, you know, chemical salesmen that show up at your farm every day, and they say, you know, this is my thing, it's the best. Well, you can put them put them to the test, develop your own experiment, run things through the run, run samples through the lab, develop your own biofeedback mechanism, and away you go. And so now what we've done, and, and it was we've essentially what was sort of this, this um hierarchical system that was controlled from universities, laboratory science, chemical companies, and so forth, has now been decentralized. You can use the information that were that you can access through apical to provide you with the own information that you need to either make new crop inputs, build, synthesize them from your own uh, uh, raw materials that you have on site, assess how those perform against uh, known, known crop and products in the environment, so on and so forth. Track your progress, compare with your friends. Uh, and the possibilities are, are significantly enhanced having this data platform and being able to store all of your reports on there at once. But I digress again. You've got the apical agronomy method that's really all dedicated to improving soil biology and plant health by balancing soil nutrients through diverse applications of mineral inputs. We've just professionalized it and made it very systematic in the way that we're doing so through the laboratory protocols. But I want to also start to draw some distinction between what we're doing today at apical and what the typical paradigm is is out there and and then use this as a reference point for how we go from where we are today as a species to where we want to be using some of the research that some of the previous presenters in this conference have done as well and so when we start to look at addressing a problem in the field grower says hey we've got an issue whatever it might be we can then circle back to this basic six-step process that we implement Typically, but I want to really stress that most growers just go to step six and they say, we want to, we want biotic stress relief. We want those insects gone today. Well, if you don't understand the five steps that came before it and the stress that the plant encountered on the way to be becoming susceptible, you're going to be on a treadmill trying to get off of it. And so I, I would care to say that our species has been on a treadmill for about 50, 60 years. We've got to get off of it. And this is how. So what we've learned is there's deeper levels within um, within plant physiology that most people are not even 
aware of or looking at, not even close. And so when we dig into some of these, some of these data sets through the LEAFS app or through the soil, now we can understand that before, long before that insect showed up, we had a carbon to nitrogen ratio that went out of balance. We had abiotic stress that happened to that plant, or we had a toxin that came in through the plants having non-selective access to soil nutrients. Really want to drill that point home. When you don't have sufficient carbon in the soil environment, you, your plant can't access the nutrients it wants. It's going to be force fed by what it has available to it. Sort of like if you go to, you know, like I spend a lot of time on the road going to visit growers across the, the Western states. And when I do, I, I stop into a convenience store, can't eat hardly anything in there, not even the water, not the food or anything. It's all essentially poison, right? In one form or another, saturated fats, high amounts of sugar, all kinds of chemicals of uh, different shapes and sizes and so on and so forth. So if there's been this toxin that's been into the plant soil environment and it's preventing the plant from accessing the nutrients that it doesn't or that it really truly needs, now all of a sudden we've got this cascading, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, disaster um, that's waiting to happen that is our food supply. And unfortunately, as much as we want to talk about nutrient density, we're so far from that today. We really need to get back to square one, get back to the basics, stop all the fluff, roll up our sleeves, look at the data, use, use hardcore science. We can get there. And through this process, we realized that the data wasn't even enough, that, that the inputs out there themselves are not conducive to building the appropriate systems where plants can grow healthy crops. Okay, and so through our network of global vendors and crop input manufacturers and crop input uh, suppliers, we've developed a whole range of crop inputs that are available on our website. And we have four more range more coming to the table here shortly um, that are extremely excited about. I can't express how excited I am about some of these inputs. Um, the initial beta testing that's happened um, from some of these inputs is is. It's mind blowing. Um, you know, so growers are calling some of these inputs the silver bullet or um, uh, the greatest thing I've ever seen, or they say things like the plant shouldn't look this good, or they almost look fake. Um, those types of uh, uh, that type of feedback, and so our entire food system is resting upon wrong inputs, on wrong data, put together in a wrong way. It's a sad state of affairs. And this is what I realized to a lesser degree over 20 years ago and why I dedicated my life to doing this. So once all this is starting to come together for us as a company, we developed what we refer to as our apical guide to plant nutritional stress. And so there's this key thing that we talk about here at apical where visible stress starts out as nutritional stress. Okay, so your plant might have a nutritional excess or a nutritional deficiency, and then three three days or three weeks later, ah, oh, that thing's not growing right, right? Or it shows up as a red on your RGB on your NDVI. If, for those of you that are burst into into uh, uh, you know infrared or um, other types of analytics, what we're seeing is that your nutritional stress is is vital to every other thing that's happening on your farm. And so if you manage your nutritional stress properly, the chances of you actually managing your plant stress significantly improve. And I'll go into this plant stress concept here in a second. But what we've done now is, so we, so we came up with this guide that's about 20 pages long, um, and it's got uh, plant nutritional stress, soil nutritional stress, both deficiencies and excesses, and what the actual individual elements are doing quant qualitatively. So if you look at elements such as aluminum, uh, in, that's here on the, on the screen. Um, aluminum inhibits root growth, increases deuterox susceptibility, decreases calcium uptake, alters formation of root hairs, leads to oxidative stress. Okay, well, what about sodium? Well, sodium causes salt stress, induces chloride accumulation, impairs water uptake, creates osmotic stress, develops self-reinforcing uptake of salt, disrupts overall biochemistry, inhibits root development, destabilizes cell wall permeability, interferes with calcium uptake, increases potassium demand and induces overproduction of ROS. This is what's happening in the field. And so now we've actually added in the last 12 months a way of expressing that to our growers. And so with any grower now that runs a test through our lab, they get a qualitative uh, assessment of what's happening in the field as well, each element by element. And so if you take each 
both cells uh, as an example such as this, where you have a high rate level of aluminum. Well, you can see that the aluminum is essentially negatively impacting the root development, accumulating in the cell wall, altering the function of the plasma membranes, blocking cell division, and so on. And so what you'll actually see is this explanation of what's happening in the field versus looking at the leaf test and just saying, oh, I got high aluminum. Eh, not, super, not super worried about that. Let's go put some more nutrients on and move and nitrogen and move on. Okay. No, that's we need to stop. We need to take a step back, realize what this, what the plant is trying to tell you, what they're experiencing, and then how you can use that information to make better judgment. And so there is a deeper level to actual nutritional stress, and that's the long-term cumulative nutritional stress, which actually is full systemic stress. So if you look at oxidative, molecular, abiotic, metals, and so on and so forth, all of these are, are key layers of stress, and I'll get to a few more in a second. But a number of years ago, we added the Lux analytes to any, seed, any leaf, soil, or water test. And so those deluxe analytes are listed on the left-hand side, oxidation reduction potential, total proteins, free amino acid, total phenols, heavy metals, and ethanol. These are key analytes that can be looked at and they can help you understand some of the other layers of what's happening out there in your plants. Okay. So if we understand that ORP is high, we can understand that that plant is under antiox or uh, antioxidant deficiency or oxidative stress. Or if we see that uh, free amino nitrogen is, uh, is, is high, well, that actually has an almost one-to-one -one correlation in even in academic literature um, to insect and disease pressure, or actually specifically insect pressure. Uh, insects come to feed on free amino nitrogen. So anyway, there's a huge amount of uh, information that can be accessed from deluxe analytes within our, within our leaf, leaf sap analysis as well as our soil analysis. These analytes now are a deeper layer to understanding what's happening in the plant. If you're looking at, at different types of heavy metals, right, arsenic or mercury or um, chromium or, or cadmium, for instance, these have huge, huge down-regulating effects on all of the other nutrients. Okay. And so the other the other key elements who are deluxe analytes, it actually allows you to, to intelligently, effectively, and judiciously use plant biostimulants. Because now we understand if the silicon product is actually going to have an effect or if an antioxidant uh, type uh, product like an algae or something like that may have an effect or, or so on and so forth. And here, without further ado, is one of our diagrams that where we've uh, identified a number of key points of plant stress. And uh, I, I really talk a lot about plant stress uh, nowadays because we see it so much show up in nutritional values on data sets within the leaf test. And so my experience as an agronomist running leaf samples from 2017 to 2020, going out and, and seeing in our local environment here in the Pacific Northwest, those data sets, how they corresponded in real time with my own eyes, what that meant to the data how that looked to the, you know, how, that, how the data made the plant look, looking at that with my own eyes in the field, looking at my, looking at the tests at the same time and doing it over across hundreds of blocks, across multiple different, um, uh, you know, multiple different bioregions and growing environments and soil types. All this concept of plant stress was hugely um, evident to me. You could see when plants were under extreme heat and you could see their data go crazy on the leaf, on the leaf test and the chlorides and the salts go bonkers. Or you could see when you had uh, heavy soil compaction or when, when folks were doing over acidification, you could see the aluminum and sulfur levels skyrocket in the plant and all of a sudden the plant starts, the crops start rotting in the field. Um, all these were very uh, uh, real experiences to myself. Uh, other consultants within our network, and also environment uh, and growing environments that, that that folks that we worked with, and so experiencing plant stress, correlating it to nutritional stress, watching that data set on the leaf and soil analysis. This has been really what we've, what we've been looking at. When you dig into academic literature, plant stress is very very well studied, but in horticulture, not necessarily in agriculture. So there's this disconnect, just like. Geochemistry is separate from soil science. These disconnects, it, 
the internet's it's too big now, right? So um, anyway, okay. So say you've got a crop and it becomes uh, stressed through one of those means that I just identified. And you start to think that you're going to lo lose sy systematic reduction of crop potential. Okay, so the first thing that typically happens is microbial disruption, um, and that can happen through heat or weather, um, you know, flooding, um, drought, uh, chemicals, etc. Um, uh, and that typically then leads to a micronutrient shortage or a carbon shortage. Um, once that happens, you're very not far off from a macronutrient and imbalance, which then typically leads to a non-nutrient uptake. That cascading uh, reduction of crop potential happens whenever any any stress is, is is present, and so when folks out there, others in the industry, say things like, "We really don't understand what the crops are uh, look like, or what healthy crops are, or how to get there," um, I would definitely agree. We don't really understand. I've seen shades of it, and and. and once in a while, you'll see things like, oh, that that was close, right? Or we did a 20-ton blueberry or we did a, you know, a 15-ton cherry or, or, or whatever the situation might be. Um, there's still additional layers that these plants can access. I don't know that there's really an end to the potential for plants to uptake nutrients when you have sufficient carbon. And so I really want to drill down on that in, in, the, in the middle of that triangle is carbon deficiency. You're creating susceptible hosts through the deficiency of carbon and the envir environmental conditions. Once that pathogen is present, you typically have a insect or disease breakout. And so when you have nutritional stress, the plant is faced with three options. One, it can continue to try to grow. Two, it can try to essentially self-cannibalize itself. Or three, it can create self-injury. So what we found throughout our research is that nut plant nutrient excesses create suicidal tendencies and plant nutrient deficiencies create self-cannibalism. So in other words, if plant doesn't have sufficient nitrogen, magnesium, potassium, et cetera, you see this start to cannibalize its own leaves to, pr to promote growth into the new part of the plant. Okay, that makes sense. A lot of people get that. But the other piece of the puzzle is that plants have too much salt, chloride, aluminum, manganese, whatever it might be, any of the nu nutrient can become uh, essentially excessive. When you have plant nutrient excesses, those suicidal tendencies now um, uh, are, are essentially a defense mechanism so that the plant limits its own cancerous growth or imbalanced or um, abnormal growth. The second thing that happens is stress proteins get created, the living de dead cells get sorted, the dead cells get dissolved by other stress proteins, dead organs get discarded and limited or no growth continues. Well, what happens? This Is this not exactly what you see when you see apples drop fruit in the middle of summer? Or if you see blueberries drop blooms uh, at petal fall, right? Where they actually drop the fruit or, or what have you. So by looking at long-term data sets and comparing those two crops that were uh, exhibiting these symptoms year over year, from 2017 to 2021, this is what we actually learned was that this is actually happening in real time. And so your flower abortment, your petal abortment, your petal misshapen, your, uh, your, your fruit drop, all of these things are being caused by plant nutrient excesses. And it's so sad because oftentimes we're thinking that we're deficient in nutrients when really we're typically excessive in the wrong ones. And so why, right? So I mentioned a minute, a few minutes ago that without carbon, you can have no selective root uptake, right? You, you, the plant can't, it's, it's going to be force fed. It's only going to uptake all that food from, from the 7-Eleven, essentially. And so that's your 1970s paradigm, right? But we're not in the 70s anymore. We got to move on. Parents are getting old. We've got cell phones now, right? iPhones, whatever. VR, all kinds of things. Okay, well, our production of food has to match this. Come on, guys, we got to get this together. So your basic soil valuation and plant evaluation now in 2020 is significantly different. Through soil mineral and assessment, carbon storage room release, microbial management, and allopathy, you can access and manage most problems with your crops. The plant sap testing should only be for, the, for when you don't do soil balancing properly, okay? Don't get me wrong, plant sap is a great tool, but you can end up over relying upon plant sap if you don't really fully understand what happens in soils. And this is one thing that happened to us 
and it was one of the reasons why we went back to the drawing board and really wanted to understand soils, physical, mineral, weathering of rocks, what the soil is, how did it happen, how did it work, so on and so forth. And so two years ago, we trademarked the, the term, the new paradigm of crop nutrition, because there was no other really effective um, group in the country or really even in the world that I could find uh, other than a few people that were doing similar things where they actually looked at analysis technology, built laboratory methods from scratch, it utilized accepted theories within modern plant science, applied that to field research, used principal guidelines, hardcore data science, and built agronomic inputs to match all of those things. And so we didn't really have anything else to call it. Like folks, after a while, we're doing all this work. We started at the plant sap lab, like that's what we did. But eventually folks were saying, well, what is apical? And I, I started to really wonder that myself after a while. I was like, we started off trying to be sap lab and do some consulting, but here we are now, we've learned a tremendous amount. And so after this time, we've called, we call it the new paradigm of crop nutrition. And the technical definition of that is an innovative comp compilation of analysis technology, laboratory me methods, accepted theories, field research, principal guidelines, data science, agronomic inputs that represents a significant departure from conventional agriculture and a structured, structured path to crop improvement. That's what we do at Apical all day, every day. I titled the, the um, ironically, I, I entitled the um, company Apical Crop Science to begin with, but it didn't really understand that that was actually what the science would be, is the science of healthy crop growing. It's a full, almost an own branch of science at this point, what we're doing here. We're so far off the map when, when it comes to soil analysis and the other labs out there, or leaf analysis, what most of the other guys are doing, application technologies, and so on and so forth. So for you, those of you that are listening, if this is of any interest to you, feel free to reach out to our staff. I'll give you the, our, our contact at the end. Moving on, here's a few of the theories that we've come up with and the research methods and, and, and basic um, uh, assessment uh, postulates and standards that we operate upon. So in other words, we we start with the, pro, uh, the postulate that plants are autotrophic and resilient under appropriate conditions. I can walk outside my office right now and and, and identify thousands of plants that are that have zero fertilization, that have that are completely fed by their own accord, that have zero insects and disease, and that are entirely resilient to most long term stress. Compare that to what's happening agronomically. We are a mess in this country and beyond, okay? So the next thing we, we discovered by, by analyzing plant sap and tissue and leaves of growing plants out in the wild, balance of nature, new leaf to old leaf, okay? It's also very well accepted that lab equipment is precise, errors can be tracked and traced and eliminated, that plant growth would requires different stages of nutritional demands, and that plant nutrient translocation principles exist. So upon those, we rest we rest all of our theories, research methods, and standards. Plant nutritional stress has a direct effect on plant susceptibility. Systemic stress often manifests as insect and disease. By designing appropriate fertilization, we can reverse and alleviate stress, insect and disease susceptibility. All these things are, are true, proven to be true, we prove it a daily, on a daily basis. And so back to square one, plant detoxification, mineral balancing, biological augmentation through carbon fertilization, okay? can't get there, we can't get to the new paradigm, we can't get to nutrient density without making sure that carbon is in our brain. And so when we talk about mother nature, and I'm a big fan of mother nature's technology and understanding how that technology is a model or can be used as a model for what we're trying to do in the field. Um, all plants have oxygen, car carbon and nitrogen ratios and deficient deficiency is that huge barrier. When that carbon and nitrogen ratio is optimal, plants create healthy microbial communities in the field. And so for those of you that are interested in biological agriculture, I would challenge you to get your carbon and nitrogen ratio good in your plant first, then your soil, right? If you can't do it in the soil, just do it in the plant first. That can help you to create microbial communities in the soil environment. The higher the intake of balanced carbon and nitrogen, you get carbon and oxygen optimization, the lower intake balanced carbon and nitrogen, you get carbon deficiencies. Those carbon deficiencies, again, I want to stress that those are manifesting as we 
refer to as plants that require insect and disease remediation, i.e. pesticides, fungicides, insecticides. And so here, if you actually look at a handful of different um, organisms, materials that are that are commonly found on farms, you'll see that there's a carbon constant that that carbon rate, that carbon ratio range, carbon to nitrogen ratio range is settling in at. When we're outside of that carbon to nitrogen ratio range, all of a sudden we face susceptibility. Okay. And so one of the things we often do within our consulting is this thing has way too much nitrogen, you need to apply carbon, or it's got way too much carbon, you need to apply nitrogen. We're constantly trying to rebalance that. And once you use that carbon fertilization properly, you get the detoxification, mineral balancing, and biological augmentation right. You can then reduce stress, rebalance minerals, and rebalance the own endophytes within the plant from the soil up through the plants. So this is how plants go from degraded to healthy or back. And so this is this, this a big continuum, right? Depending on how we're interacting with the plants. And if there's one thing that I can stress today, is that there's a huge opportunity for all of us as humans to interact with the plant kingdom using some of the technologies that we've developed or other folks that are using, doing similar things within the industry. It's a really great opportunity because we all eat plants one way or another. And so shouldn't we interact with them a little bit more? Um, I, I would say so. So again, our traditional par our, our current paradigm versus what we're doing, NPK, Soil health, bare ground, leaching, water fire, all, all the things you don't want to hear about, right? You need to move past this. And so, because when we're applying too much or too little, all of these things are actually happening on a macro scale. So the insect resistance to, to pesticides, disease resistance to pesticides, crop yields are going down, crop genetic diversity, crop diversity in a, in a particular bioregion. You know, here in Oregon, we have incredibly fertile ground. But growers have been uh, steered away from growing a lot of crops that are actually viable here because of these types of situations, because of 40 to 50 year accumulation of ag chem and deficiency of carbon within the soils. Okay. And ultimately, it, it, it leads to poor human health, watershed health, species diversity. All these things are being affected by the, by the way that we grow crops. It's ridiculous the way that we're doing things currently. So, Let's progress, guys. Let's move to nutrient density. Let's think about how we get away from where we are today. Break these chains that are binding us. Break out of the fence and move forward, okay? So let's start with carbon efficiency, okay? So I think we can all agree on that. There's not a single regenerative agriculture topic that I've ever heard where somebody doesn't talk about carbon. Let's get deep into carbon, right? Let's get deep into, into plant and soil nutrients, right? We won't want to go towards microbes because it's cool and sexy, but at the end of the day, minerals are very uh, predictable and um, they can actually be tracked and traced a little cleaner and easier um, than some of the microbes. I mean, I know that the microbes have a lot of benefit, but if we don't have carbon, we don't have microbes. So from our perspective here at Apical, we're super into microbes, but we talk carbon first. Don't have carbon. You're wasting money on microbes and your microbes will die if they haven't died already. Once that carbon deficiency has been alleviated, you can typically get a, uh, some type of a break for, on your insect and disease. And then over time, you can accumulate carbon that will essentially reverse that nutritional density decline. And so really, let's, think, let's take this stepwise. How do we get back to the nutritional density of crops. So the removal of stress creates health. Healthy crops are balanced from new leaf to old leaf. Nutrient stress has physical outcomes that create generalized stress. Generalized stress creates vulnerabilities that are, in, that are exploited by insects and disease, okay? So if we focus not on the insects and disease, but on the precipitating factors three, three steps prior, now all of a sudden we've actually got a potential pathway towards nutrient density that's maybe a little bit less expensive. And so again, circling back to carbon, plants typically are, are taking the amount of carbon that they can access, assessing it in their own way. I don't know how they necessarily do it intelligently, but they do. And they assess how much they can increase their yield, their quality, their sugars or their proteins 
And then depending upon how, the, the, the assessment of, of how much carbon the plant can access in which form, it makes a judgment as to which combination of those four things it can, it can develop. And if anything goes wrong in that process from start to finish, right? So the plant does this early on in its lifetime. If anything else goes wrong, you get heat, you get moisture, you get X, Y, and Z. Plant's going to upregulate bio as much carbon as it can in the form of biomolecules. So phenols, antioxidants, flavanols, et cetera, all the things that folks talk about, um, you know, but certain types of vitamins. All of these things upregulate when plants are under stress. But they're only upregulated to the extent the plant needs them, not to the extent we might desire them. And so, in other words, you may have an ability for a plant to upregulate antioxidants when it's under stress. And you can use that as a mechanism to elicit greater antioxidant content in that crop. But what's going to happen is you'll end up with a trade off. And so, what the, when these plants, the plants have to balance nutrients microbiology, physical growing habitat, weather, light, all these things, just the way that you have to balance your family, your job, your social life, your hobbies, and, and, and your ancestors, right? Your, your parents or whoever you take care of. And so there's this huge connection between the nutrition of the crops and the nutrition of the humans. And another point I want to really stress also is antimicrobials, Copper, chloride, iodine, sodium, nitrate, aluminum, sulfur, all these are antimicrobial elements. When they come in high, uh, high levels into the plant or soil, all of a sudden, they're anti the, 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 the microbial link to the, to the plants and soils are gone. And so if you have high, high salts, high aluminum, high chlorides, all these things, you're going to continually be on a treadmill of microbes when instead you can use proper techniques to actually lower those, then keep those microbes so they just cycle on their own. So this is a difference between a forest versus um, an agronomic environment that requires inputs all continually. Um, looking at heavy metals is a key thing too um, when you're talking about nutrient density, right? So if we're poisoning ourselves with heavy metals or aluminum, um, it's a big deal. Uh, chlorine as well. Uh, I don't even know where to start with in terms of how chlorine disrupts the, the, the gut microbiome and so on and so forth. There's others that are way more versed in this. All I know is it certainly does um, does affect it. I personally feel when I drink a lot of chlorine, I feel it in my sinuses, um, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, I digress again. The key point that I was trying to make a second ago is that nutrient density is really in the eye of the beholder. Not all fruit is created equal. Trade-offs exist in nature and plant stress triggers trade-offs. So that reduction in crop potential triggers trade-offs. So the plant will, will trade yield for phenols. So it'll say, well, we're going to recreate, we're going we're to cut the yield of this plant by, by 10 or 15%. We're going to upregulate some phenols to handle the heat stress. Move on, guys. All right, we're done. Well, what if the plant wants high yield, um, but then it's continually overfed nitrogen, right? Well, now you're going to have low protein, potentially, potentially low sugars and low phenols, but you get high yield. Right. And so there's trade-offs, right? So low yield, high mineral content, high phytonutrients. You know, how do you get there? And so I think when we start to talk about nutrient density, the nutrient density truly is going to be in the eye of the beholder. So in other words, do we need more protein? Do we need more sugar or less? Do we need more? Uh, um, say we've got, um, um, we'll call it a, uh, 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 you know, salmonella or some other sort of microbiological poisoning. Is there a way that we could use foods to help that, right? Um, in an in a, in a antimicrobial way, even. What if we have uh, plants that we really want a high ph phenolic content or, or really complex sugars? Well, we can, we can elicit that through certain growing techniques. And then maybe that changes the, the way that a wine uh, expresses itself or berries express themselves in this particular situation. Um, these are certain things that we're ex experimenting with, have experience in certain ways here at Apical with our customer base. And we're really excited about moving this new paradigm forward from where we are today into one that's really actually focused on the, the food quality and all the steps that the plant took to get there. And so um, as Dan kind of alluded to, um, the last piece of the puzzle, at least the, the current last piece of the puzzle that we're moving towards, and this should be available 
um, later this month. Um, we, the laboratory protocols have been um, have been completed, uh, established, and, and verified. Uh, we've been running beta tests on on this type of mineral analysis test for your end crop. So essentially, so say you grow bell peppers or wheat or carrots or what have you, and you want to essentially test and compare the value of your nutrition in your crop versus uh, a crop that's the grocery store or coming from a competitor or coming from a disease part of your field or what have you. Um, we are preparing and we'll be prepared later this month to offer the plant nutrient analysis and it's, uh, we'll call it our version one form. Um, we're calling it our version one form because we're essentially setting up to look at heavy metals and contamination, key nutrients and basic indicators. There's a lot more, um, certainly by no means is this comprehensive or of um, a, a complete effort, right? This is our jumping off point with things that we can do today uh, in our lab that we know will help growers assess the nutrients that they're creating from their produce and compare and contrast that, maybe use it as a marketing tool, maybe use it as, a, as their own um, uh, contemplation uh, piece to understand how they can actually create better um, uh, crops for their, for their customer base. And so it's our desire to release this uh, later this month and hopefully growers will understand that this is a, um, this is a key piece of the puzzle um, with uh, feedback from our, uh, from our initial beta testers is that this, this will be a really great tool for them to um, uh, promote the health of their crop and how it compares and contrasts to others. Yeah. And so with that, I really would like all of you to um, just consider how you're voting with your personal choices. Um, consider the opportunities if you're involved in ag or ag tech um, and how we can integrate soil and plant health uh, with, with ag tech because that's really the where we're at now. I mean, if we get if the technology gets um, too much further out in front of our uh, of the the agronomic technology, um, i.e., if the robots get out in front of healthy plants and healthy soils, we're in real trouble. Um, and so, you know, us as a company, uh, we're very interested in, in collaboration, um, social interactions, um, uh, research projects. Uh, field trials, um, um, customer interactions, uh, using our network uh, to, to essentially continue to improve our technology and its applications uh, to folks like yourself. So when we can piece these things together, um, there's a real opportunity for uh, folks to grow better food, to eat better food, to have, live better lives, and to uh, essentially be better humans. And so um, I think that's all I have for the structured presentation. I did go a touch over it in time, so forgive me, Dan. Um, but this is, if you want to get in touch with us at Apical, this is how you do. And um, with that, I'm going to, I think, open it up for questions. I'll stop sharing my screen here, and we'll go from there. Beautiful. <clears throat> love, love, love the passion, David. You're one of the only guys that uh, I think maybe topped me in that, uh, in that realm, you know, so. <laughs> I remember we met just only a couple of years ago that we met. I'm not, I'm not sure how we, how we missed each other for so long, but um, I was just completely impressed, completely impressed. And you didn't. It was definitely it. like a uh, a long, long lost uh, reuniting re re when yeah, uh, yeah, we got together. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, wow. So I've got a bunch of notes here and of things to accentuate and uh, try to you know delve a little more deeply into. Erwin, do you want to yeah. have any comments or or questions or or yeah? I've got a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think they will look at in this. Uh, half an hour, but uh, I think David and I will be in touch later. So uh, very interesting, uh, David, uh, really opened a, a lot of doors for me. And um, a practical question, as a farmer, um, if you want to do it with your own resources, what is the best way to enhance carbon in your soil? Well, I mean, I think each uh, uh, environment is different. Um, and so, you know, good, good solid soil analytics is the place to start. So like folks that are looking at, um, you know, either like the Haney test has some decent carbon metrics in it, um, or some other folks that are, that are, you know, some of the NRCS labs actually are doing um, uh, some of the more, uh, at least in our uh, country. Um, I know you're in, in Holland. And so 
there's probably some labs over there that are doing, you know, particular organic matter or dissolved carbon or um, uh, water soluble carbon type metrics. Um, I would encourage you to look at a few of those. Um, and I would also encourage you to maybe look at the diverse inputs that are out there, you know, biochar, um, maybe some of the ones that we've, you might've used in the past, uh, if you've already used them for many years, maybe like diversify a little bit. So, you know, for years, many years, I did car, um, you know, compost and compost teas and maybe fish and seaweeds and things like that. And, and once I started to open my realm up into, you know, uh, plant-based biostimulants, bioflavonoids, um, uh, microbial exudates, um, um, biochars, uh, soluble organic acids, um, uh, things like that, uh, the, 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 the nature of the way that I was interacting with carbon seemed to change a little bit. Um, and that seemed to, to open some doors. So um, I would say, you know, carb soil carbon is, you know, continue to investigate, get get good at, it. really look at different inputs, if that, investigate the inputs, compare them, um, you know, prepare the in one input to another, you know, in an individual field trial, you know, a row versus another row or, you know, a block versus another, um, those sorts of things. Um, there's no hard and fast answer, but we've uh, what I can say is, um, biochar definitely has a role to play, humic substances for sure, um, compost and, and microbial uh, types of exudates, um, those also, um, you know, your essential oils and your fatty acids and all these, um, they may not be thought of as carbon, but they are, right? So, so phenolic molecule from a thyme plant, that's mostly carbon, right? Or, or you know, a, a cinnamon, a cinnaldehyde from a cinnamon plant, that's, that's mostly carbon. And, and so those, plants will, uh, or those types of um, inputs will actually raise carbon levels in the plant, not necessarily in the soil, but they'll raise them in the plant. And then that that um, carbon deficiency in the plant that I kind of was alluding to, um, and, and that carbon imbalance between nitrogen, that there is, is a key layer. And so like when you look at those essential oil type, there, there are a lot of carbon like jammed together, like really concentrated carbon that then diverses throughout the plant's own, own system. Or like you take a humic, it's almost like putting a humic in the plant, right? Um, so anyway, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but those are just a few of the strategies, yeah. So, but you mean that by getting carbon in the plant, you make the plant more balanced or being able to handle its excesses by then making the photosynthesis photosynthesis better and hence um, extracting carbon from the atmosphere into the soil through the root exudates. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's it's not your point to uh, put carbon by these inputs like at, as a as a bar to raise in the soil. I mean. Uh, okay, Maybe so with compost, you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, twenty years ago, um, uh, you know, when I was in my market farming heyday, um, you know, I, I would go great crops in in market farming environments, but we would put you know, hundred ton of compost out before we got started, right, and raise that carbon level in the soil. Well, when you talk about trying to do that on a couple thousand acres, yeah. I mean, you do the numbers, you're talking millions of millions of, uh, of yards of compost. And so you just, it doesn't compute. And so you have to be a little bit more creative. Um, and so he you helps do... everyone else of his compost too. Yeah, 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 right, right. I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, we're lucky here in the Northwest, we have sawdust, we have compost, we have a lot of forage and dairy and, you know, things like that, but other folks are not so lucky. And so, um, uh, you know, biochar is a big one. Like I, I really encourage a lot of guys to look at biochar, or give that another look. Um, it's not as easy to work with. There's some nuances to using it, um, but the it doesn't make sense to try to take every soil out there and go from a um, you know from a three percent organic matter to a to a nine per, eight or a nine percent and get those plants up to where they need to be. It's just not. It's never going to happen. But if we can spoon feed those plants out of the out of the problems that they're in, and so that's really my point. Um, and uh, and we can do it, you know, okay, there's a carbon deficiency in the plant and we can spray thyme oil to temporarily raise the carbon in the plant. Or we can see a, um, a, an excess in the soil that we've identified through plant sap and then we can we can fertigate something like an organic acid or a humic substance package or, or both um, and then temporarily raise the soil carbon so that the plant can access the carbon that it needs. Again, I want to distinguish between access the the plant carbon sufficiency versus soil carbon sufficiency, which is what where a lot of the academic and, and government researchers focus on in soil carbon, which it's got to be there, sure, 
but it's just not. And, and we're so far off that to, to try to get there is, is, it's just stupid and, and time pointless. And so if we can focus on the plant carbon, that we can, that is a, a totally manageable goal, super easy to access, very implementable on a day-to-day -day basis and can affect all of us immediately, very positively. Is this also, if you have high aluminum in your soil and in your plants, is this also the key for that? So great question. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's, uh, that brings up a point that would have probably other been otherwise been, uh, overlooked. And, um, so that is, so, you know, in regenerative agriculture, you often hear about carbon deficiency, right? Folks in the soils, right? Soils are low in carbon, depleted, whatever. How often have you heard of the term silicon deficiency? I yeah. have because a certain weeds can tell you that <laughs> you have there it. You go. Yeah. yeah. Well, Good, because you're, I mean, you're also, you're, you're pretty deep into it yourself, right? But most folks, when you say silicon deficiency, they, they look at you like, you know, like some sort of pink, you know, alien just popped out of my head because they just don't get it. Um, so I would contend that silicon deficiency is just as much, if not more, um, of a problem for plants than, uh, than carbon deficiency. Um, and so the silicon deficiency relates directly to what you're mentioning uh, is aluminum excess, aluminum toxicity it also relates to all the other heavy metals toxicities that i mentioned um, as well as the plant's ability to access phosphorus the plant's ability to um to upregulate and downregulate calcium and potassium um it acts as a as a really uh as a nice fulcrum for the plant to access more potassium or more calcium um there's just i could go on and on about the benefits of silicon and and the different forms and how you use it and so on and so forth but um the deficiency of silicon is extremely uh it's an extreme problem uh, if not more so than carbon um i just don't get into it because it gets more complex uh the, the silicate chemistry is tricky and so on but um so anyway uh, the silicon deficiency is where you should look to uh to decrease the limit interesting so <laughs> um, you haven't given any sort of broad strokes generalizations of of products like I would you know historically when someone has a, lo a low silicon le high aluminum level I would say that's when you need rock dust that's when you need your finely ground basalt and 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 granite materials for instance um, mm -hmm. yeah so I mean I know you've told me some stories about some was it micronized biochar or micronized humates that were Oh, I'm not yeah. quite sure how small they were and were applied at three or four kilograms per hectare or something ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Two kilograms I mean, per like pounds and you're worried about creating and tying up nitrogen in certain cases. Some of the stuff. Yeah. So you've got materials that are, <clears throat> I mean, I think what's really, really interesting is, you know, you've, you've, you've attacked this like a <laughs> mad scientist, like there is a pattern here and I'm going to find it. And, and you've and you've and you've done all this work and you've, it's really completely brilliant. I'm not sure you're going a mile a minute because you had so much to say. I'm not sure if people really were able to capture how how significant it is what you've what you've done. But and all the way out now to like oftentimes a really simple, really inexpensive, small quantity of thing. Yeah, you actually know what's going on. Is all that's needed to completely, you know, pivot things back to where they should be. And in many cases. You know, a little bit is perfect. More is is categorically not that whole moron principle, which I think, again, you said to me in the past. To in many people's cases, excess is the foundational issue, and it's not about deficiency of this or deficiency of that. That's a fun, that's foundational issue. You talked about chlorine and and aluminum and and things like that, which I think perhaps are more relevant concerns on large scale and in irrigated areas, which is where you're from, um, and historically chemicalized operations as well. But certainly you have arid dynamics and warm weathered soils in many parts of the of the world. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if there's a specific question there, except maybe a couple examples of the types of materials you would recommend. If you can give us three or four minutes, just with a, like, there's a micronized this that is the scale yeah, yeah. that or this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, sure. Give people something yeah, more sure, practical sure. to take home with them out of um, yeah. I think Irwin Nuggets. What are some yeah, basic yeah. beyond the concepts that people can understand or start to do? Yeah, so, um, uh, okay, so different class. So I've actually go back in the presentation to, there's a slide that I put up in there is uh, different, uh, uh, I think it was entitled, um, 
uh, same application technologies, new paradigm inputs. And so it had a ball of different categories. And so some of them you've heard of, you know, microbials or, um, uh, you know, granular lime or what have you, you know, things like that. But what we're doing is we've taken, you know, sort of those, you know, those two key concepts. We'll start there, you know, silicon deficiency and carbon deficiency. And then we've broken that up into um, applicable means, right? And so we'll take, okay, biochar and humic substances. We'll take two different categories of carbon. We'll add another one, organic acids. So you've got uh, biochar, humates, organic acids. Okay. So now we take each one of those and then they're going into pelleted inputs, then they're going into liquid suspensions, and then they're going into foliar sprays, and then they're going into X, Y, uh, wettable powders, right? And at, at low cost, at low price point. So now you've got the same technique, but you can unpack it for a dryland grower, but you can un unpack it for a, um, for a berry grower um, on irrigated. You can unpack it for a small farm grower um, on, on small drip irrigation, or you can unpack it in a, in a pivot type growing environment, like a, like overhead irrigation. And so what we're doing is we're taking the, the basic principles and then we're just reimagining the way that things, that these things are delivered and accessed from the grower. And so we'll say, okay, well, you know, silica, right? It's just sand. Well, it's not just sand when it's at one micron or less. Um, at that point, it becomes intracellular, and you can repair cell walls by applying it in foliar. Um, and you say, well, bar well biochar is going to tie up so soil nitrogen, not at eight microns, run through your drip irrigation at one pound per acre. And in fact, it actually feeds microbes and, and, and oftentimes causes a, a release of nitrogen from, from the soil environment. Um, those are two, two key techniques. Then we take the silicon, we break it out. Calcium silicate, magnesium silicate, potassium silicate, pure silicate, right? And then we look at what, how much silicates in things like soft rock phosphate, or um, uh, and so on. And and by the end of it, what you have is a, a toolkit that's been built on lab results, but now it can go into each different growing environment, each different price point, make a difference for those growers today. And they're not going to have to wait three years. Right, and it can start transitioning these guys to the extent that they're that they're excited about doing it. it starts to pull pull them out of, you know, whatever the ditch if that's where they are, or or just conventional, or um, can take organic and make it better than it already is. Um, uh, so anyway, don't want to get too off track, but yeah, those yeah. as you decrease the particle size tenfold, you you essentially take a ten x more. Uh, 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 the efficacy and make it 10x, um, the, the input and make it 10 times more efficient. So if we take, go from 10 microns to one or from 100 to 10 or from, from one to 0.1 microns, all of a sudden the efficacy goes up. But in, in addition, the amount that's required to make a difference in the field goes down. And so when some folks are like, oh, you got to put 10 tons of biochar out per acre to see a plant response, and then we say, nah, like one time. <laughs> nah, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm thinking about small farmers and people that are not necessarily from North America, um, other parts of the world who are many in attendance here. And, you know, I, well, I think it's, you've pretty made a pretty strong case if, if someone's operating at significant scale, they should at least <laughs> investigate, investigate working with you, do some experimentation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the logistics of the implementation of this on scale, on global scale and, and the, the, the feedback loop. Basically, if you do have the good data, then you can make intelligent decisions, but the logistics of getting good data and running it on, you know, smallholders operations on multiple crops, do you have a sort of a, a thought about the logistics of that or or the opportunity to take what you're doing and bring it larger um and and to smaller holders and small, yeah sure 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 yeah so so you know i do want to stress that that you know we have growers of all shapes and sizes that, that access our system in our lab and yeah. and the crop inputs across the board so i mean everything literally from bonsai um i think i've mentioned this to you in, in some of our private discussions so we've done a we've done this three-year uh experimentation into um 
sap testing on bonsai. <laughs> uh, I think we're probably the only lab in the world that's done this, and uh, it's been wildly successful, believe it or not. Um, we've remediated hundreds of different species, uh, <laughs> and it's it's uh, it's been something that I had never anticipated. So that's the smallest scale. Um, that we've that we've operated on. We'll start there, um, but we also have a lot of small farms and local CSAs that, that use our system. Um, they're more into the soils, obviously, because you can get a little bit more data from one soil test. So if you're doing, if you've got one acre and you're growing fifteen different types of crops, uh, versus you know you do one soil test, that can get you a good amount of information for that. So we encourage that in those situations. Um, where they have problems, we do definitely encourage leaf testing, uh, leaf sap testing. And so because sap analysis is a really strong tool, it's still relatively affordable. And so you can't go out and test a different type of pepper and every different type of eggplant and, and so on in your, in your market garden. But if you've done your work on your soil and your water testing, you don't, shouldn't need to. It should be used to handle persistent varieties or to optimize high dollar value crop or high dollar value varieties or um, what have you in, in your field, right? So if you have, well, we've got 30% of our carrots are knots and then the other 60% are chantonet. Well, test your chantonet and if test your knots when they go bad, right? Or something like that. Um, and so there's general guidelines that we recommend. We say don't over test, um, rely on good data. Right. We don't like to get in this just test and test and test and test. Like, no, no, stop. Yeah. Don't do it. Like test, get good, strong data and recommendations, and then use that and then and then feedback from there. That yeah. it's it's we don't like it when people just want to test and go around in circles. I mean, if you want to test for a full season to develop a long, long-term crop plan, that's a great way to start. Honestly, it's a super low impact, super low risk. But for the growers that are on small scale. I would definitely encourage you to, um, you know, do soil analytics, um, sap test where you can, and then only do sap testing where you're going to do applications, right? And that's 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 the key. Um, with respect to international, um, we're currently, I think, uh, registered to receive samples from about twelve or thirteen countries. Um, if there's, uh, if you're uh, from abroad and you're interested in using our lab, um, I would encourage you to inquire um, if we're accepting samples from your country. Um, it's just a quick email to info at apical, and we're happy to 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 look into it real quick and give you a, a say thumbs up or thumbs down. It's it's a mixed bag, honestly. Um, we have certain countries in Europe, Asia, South America, North America. Um, yeah, and I I can't tell you which countries uh, are on the list at this point, but a lot of them, um, and, and continuing to grow. Um, in terms of feedback time, um, certainly, you know, when I drive to one of my growers, pull a, pull a leaf test, bring it back to the lab test lab and say, Hey, I want this, you know, first in the queue for tomorrow. I mean, that's a unfair advantage, right? But your average grower that has sends in samples from, um, even around the world, oftentimes can get their, get results back to them and a recommendation in under, uh, in seven to 10 days time. And that includes, um, uh, DHL, uh, courier service. So, um, when samples come into our lab, they're typically analyzed the following day. So samples that come in today is a Tuesday. The sample, anything that comes in today will report tomorrow, Wednesday evening. And so that's our that's our general commitment. Sometimes it gets a little bit fuzzy um, if we're really, really busy. Um, but uh, we've been able to access both extremely large and extremely small scale, extraordinarily positive results um, across a wide range of crops and, and, and diverse. Uh, soil and bioregions, growing environments, greenhouses, substrates, and so on. Yeah. Um, the leaf sap testing is a great tool. And if you've never experienced it, um, you, you need to. You need to get into it a little bit because it's uh, you're missing out for sure. Well, I think, I mean, just the, the whole the whole suite of, of data that you've and modes of assessment that you've developed and the fact that you've built it out into an open data framework so people can see not only your recommendations if they're asking for those, but also where they sit in relation to everybody else who sent samples in and what their recommendations were. I think that's really, really brilliant. Um, I had a, just a question about the 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 new the new assessment um, of testing the crop as opposed to the the sap. Um, I'm presuming that will go into the database as well, and people can begin to see that. Yeah. 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 We're just creating a new uh, a new section in the grower account page, so yeah. you know you're. 
soil tests, water tests, leaf tests, crop nutrient tests, and then in, and then also later this winter, the input tests too. That's the other thing that we've been getting a lot of questions about because um, we do see a lot of contaminated crop inputs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's really important just the, the point about how do you know which product is going to work and how well it's working? Because oftentimes mm -hmm. people hear somebody who's inspiring or they'll have a personal relationship with somebody that comes by and they're a salesperson and, and you want to believe it's good, but how do you actually know how do you actually know what's working and whether you should be using it on scale? Um, in many cases, you can apply something and see some kind of response somewhat, but you're like, no, maybe it's it's happening, but I don't see it. So I think your your ability to actually interrogate these questions with serious, thoughtful data sets is really um, quite impressive. And I love how you're, how you're framing it, being open. Um, <clears throat> maybe just one more question here before we move on to the Q&A from the uh, attendees. You had, had some good points, I think, at the end there about um, what is nutrient density and the um, levels and ratios and high levels of phenols and low levels of yields. And, um, you know, I'm as someone who has done a lot of a lot of looking at this, you said it's all in the high, eye of the beholder. You know, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Because if there's some uncomfortable things that need to be said about how we define nutrient density, let's let's talk yeah. about them. You, you, you have your yeah. fingers on Data. I mean, that's my, that's my opinion, right? I mean, I, I, I want to stress that that's my personal opinion. I feel that it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, so for instance, um, we'll backtrack about four years back into the, uh, the COVID years, right. Where, um, one of the things that was a known that everybody was talking about back then was we got to get our zinc levels up, right. You know, zinc is, is a known ionophore against COVID-19 or whatever, right? So I was popping zinc and, you know, a lot of people were taking zinc or taking the zinc elderberry gummies or what have you. Well, so well, what happens if if the same thing happens that we're doing in plants? If our, what if our zinc levels go up, right? What does that do to our copper levels, our iron levels, all these other levels, right? Well, what if... We're buying a we're buying a peach from these guys down in, in California that they they spray a hundred pounds of zinc sulfate in the fall as a defoliant, yeah. and so now we've elevated our zinc levels, and then we're going to go buy buy zinc heavy the zinc heavy stone fruit, right? And then we're going to eat zinc heavy whatever sardines or whatever it is, and now our zinc levels are extremely high, right? Okay, flip that into any other any other nutrient. We're all going always going to be depressing those other nutrients. So if I would, we're, if we're accumulating one or the other. But but the whole point is I've been trying to frame nutrient density is that it's not about one element being high or one compound being high. It's about a levels and ratios and balance. And yeah, so, yeah. are you yeah. finding that? Are you finding that there is a sweet spot where things exist within a certain kind of balance, and that could be used potentially as a definition of nutrient density? Well, how how would you how would you you know propose we 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 envision this process going forward of defining quality in crops yeah i mean i honestly see the long term is that there will be no one standard frankly i feel that it's that it's a, that it has to eventually be a variable standard just the same way that a chardonnay may may have nutri different nutritional preferences from a pinot noir dan you may have different nutritional pre preferences in your body and your your blood type and your genome than me yeah, Plus the, the, the nutrients that you've been taking over the over the longer period of time um, may be slightly different than the ones that I've untaken. So I may have different imbalances than you. And so yeah. in order to get a nutrient dense, so like a, a, a piece of a piece of fruit that that has been sprayed with high levels of copper might be good for me because I already have high zinc, right? But then maybe for you, because you know, because you've been eating uh, orchard crops from uh, orchard that had sprayed co high copper for the last eight years. Now that may you may already have high copper, and so now you don't need it. And so um, I don't know if there's any sort of a way to um, assess optimization. I yeah. do think there's a way to assess contamination, and I think that's where we should start. So contamination through nitrates, aluminum, heavy metals, so, so on and so forth. And that, in, in my opinion, that's where we start off with nutrient density. Get the shit out of there first, right? Get the crap out, get it, get it out move, and say, okay, from, cause from there, typically what's going to happen is all the other levels will come up and the phenols. And it'll, will come up, it'll come up in, in ratio and in balance, in which would be zone. something we could identify as the top of the 
continue yeah. on. Let's put it out of a hundred. Um, yeah, no, I think it's your insight here is is I think extremely extremely relevant as we proceed down this this path. I'm looking forward to collaborating. Um, did you have any last question there, Erwin? You want to sh share before we yes, jump to the yeah, I, I have uh, been really uh, good insight, uh, David, because uh, I have not thought about this nutrient density as being personal dependent or how you framed it. And um, this is something to think about. It's very interesting. But um, uh, what I have is a practical question. Um, it intrigued me that you said that if you uh, make something smaller 10 times, then the efficiency will uh, increase 10 times. So what kind of tools can you can a farmer use to really um, make a material smaller? So I have used this um, um, concrete mill um, with pebbles in it, and I lay it with ceramics as sort of this ball mill. Um, but I don't know, maybe there is something more efficient that a farmer can make and use to... Um, oh, I mean... Not efficient you know, to do it yourself sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff in do, you know, DIY um, it can only, you know, can get you so far. I mean, some of the particle size reduction is, is it can be tricky, Irwin. I, I, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason why we're eliciting, you know, that same, you know, or a better response from, you know, one pound of calcium carbonate or two pounds of calcium carbonate than, than we can from 50 pounds of gypsum. It's for that reason, right? But um, how that's done, a lot of it's done in, in manufacturing type environments um, uh, that are specialized and, and set up with safety controls um, against that. Um, you know, farmers, I would encourage you to try to find those that maybe have been pre-milled or if they're not available in your bioregion, um, maybe to work uh, with somebody that has, uh, uh, that is adept at using some of those milling techniques or technologies or um, some some things like that. Um, the bigger piece, though, is, is is if you actually look at like the the environmental analysis, um, the the total digest soil analysis, what you'll find is there's just astronomical amounts of uh, nutrients in most soils, like crazy amounts, like hundreds of pounds of phosphate and you know thousands of pounds of calcium and 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 so on and so forth. And then it's just that it's all locked up behind aluminum, um, aluminosilicates, aluminophosphates, iron phosphates, iron aluminosilicates, and so forth. And so the carbon can get in there and break that stuff apart. Um, but you can also demobilize aluminum through silicon and then release some of those other, um, you know, phosphates and things to the environment. So in a nutshell, the easiest way is to access it all from your own soil through targeted applications that have already been pre-processed to that amount. I wouldn't try to encourage a lot of folks in the audience to try to get down to, you know, milling things below, you know, 20, 30 microns. Um, if you get into silicas and things like that at that at that uh, size, it's it's uh, there's severe health hazards, you know, asbestos exposure and, um, you know, yeah, things that you don't want to deal with. So I would encourage you to either a find somebody that's uh, that's good at that type of technology, milling technology that's in your local region, to look at um, uh, products that you can access either from outside the environment with an appropriate permit or something else that's that's already there. Um, and then three, uh, look at uh, using small targeted amounts of one of what you identified in one and two to access the, the latent resource that you already have. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of free minerals out there in the soil already just ready waiting to be biologically ionized if we balance the soil properly thanks yeah all right um so we got a few questions here in the in the q a looks like we should be able to cover them i think if people want to keep putting more in they should feel feel free to dina's got a couple um <clears throat> Uh, different scale of agronomy. I think she's referring to the fact that you, in many cases, are working on large operations. Can you uh, please give an example of crop biodiversity at one season at one field with some ratios and sizes? Is this a, is this a relevant question to illustrate some of the generative principles? I think that's an important topic is the, is the role of diversity of plant species, potentially. Yeah, so... When I was in uh, when I was in my market farming heyday, um, I was very into the work, uh, and I think you and I have talked about this, Dan um, Masanobu Fukuoka, and um, and how a lot of the intercropping and um, uh, living mulch techniques that have sort of been spurred by his uh, philosophies over the years, and so extremely into that, um, and and I saw really you know 
you look up some of those intercropping pairings, right? But we developed a whole range of them um, that were either based on time, height, proximity, or biochemical um, release. And so those would be kind of like the four different ways that we would develop different pairings, right? So we would pair, um, we'll say like radishes and broccoli together, right? Where radishes uh, cover the soil and prevent weeds um, while the broccoli while the broccoli establishes itself. Once once the broccoli is ready to go, rad radish needs to be harvested. The broccoli continues to grow, and so now you, you basically double crop or relay cropped on a small scale. Um, uh, another thing that we used to do is we would plant all in all of our market farms. We would we would cover crop our middles, and we would uh, you know our walking paths or your drive paths or your tractor. And so what we would do in the in the middles is we would plant either like a clover or buckwheat or what have you. And then once that once that that cover crop got grown uh, grown up, we would either terminate it via roller crimper, or we would terminate it via um, via side discharge and use it as a mulch, or we would just turn it under. And then and then access uh, and then shift our bed over into that growing into that growing area. So those are those are some of the techniques that actually originally attracted um, uh, Washington State Extension uh, to, to the work that I was doing um, in organic and regenerative at the time. And so those intercropping uh, pairings, uh, those living mulch techniques, um, obviously all the stuff around permaculture and multi species and and all that is very 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 relevant um it's just more difficult to implement on scale and in a monetary way that you can actually earn a living at it i think um i think long term you know you'll see much more of these agroecological type um environments pop, pop up they're already starting to here and there um even in perennial crops but the reality is that most of these are not even close and so if we can just start with baby steps you know repairing the soil and, and so on like I don't even talk about those techniques that I just rattled off there with any of my customers. <laughs> we rarely get to the point of, of talking about dynamic intercropping or um, or multi-species cover crops and the termination techniques and how that integrates into their system. Very, very rarely. Most of the time, they're focused on how do I deal with insects and disease um, uh, organically or regeneratively? How do I deal with weeds? How do I uh, improve my crop? How do I deal with brown rot or whatever might be happening on a day-to-day -day basis? And so... Um, you know, it's been our sort of, uh, you know, we want to put our finger in that hole where all the water is draining out of a bucket first. And so if we put our yeah. finger there. Now we can start to build up. Okay. Now we got healthy soil, we built healthy microbes. Now we got a couple of, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, you know, beetle banks and, and hedgerows and interstory crops and things like that and build up that ecosystem stepwise. But if we're so far off in terms of, plant and soil carbon content and all these other things it's just well yeah so um to the point of folks that are doing that stuff please do more of it and do it on larger scale if you can yeah. because that's really where this will end up eventually but today we have a lot of problems in our food supply and, and some of these techniques are really dedicated towards they really they were really built to do large scale agriculture i mean i can show you how to do small and mid-sized scale and just make it fun Right. And just and just exciting. And just we'll go out on this market farm, do triple intercrop and run the living mulch. And then and then we go have pee because now we don't have to weed and now we don't have to spray and we have bigger yields and all that kind of stuff. So that was really my my um, background before I ever got into sap testing was was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was just I was just listening to something. I think Henry, who just has a question here, had sent an email that. I was a link to something Christine Jones had presented a few years ago about the um, <clears throat> um, quorum sensing and talking about how, you know, if you get above a certain number of species of plants in the same area growing together, all of a sudden real magic stuff starts to happen. So yeah. certainly, you know, completely supporting that. Um, it is the reality that in many cases how a lot of food is produced is not <laughs> in that dynamic, but we should certainly be advocate, in, intending that, that as much as possible. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, okay. We've got another question. I cow uh, where we are using compost teas and extracts on the plants. Is this considered increasing the plant carbon? Oh uh, yeah. So uh, compost teas, you know, we've done some really interesting things over the years. Um, yeah, run it through the through drip irrigation, run it through foliar sprays, run it through pivots, overhead sprinklers, um, root dips, um, uh, infurrows, uh, 
um, you know, inoculants, uh, you know, cover crop inoculants, all kinds of different things. Um, it does, it does increase soil carbon, but um, not a tremendous amount. And it's very transitory. I think the question was about for the plant, should this be considered to be a plant oh. um, carbon support like you're talking yeah, yeah, about definitely, heat waves definitely. yeah yeah it's more of a more of a plant endophyte replenishment is more how i view it um because a lot of a lot of um a lot of plants are endophyte endophyte uh deficient so endophyte meaning microbes live inside the plant right for for those of you you're not familiar with that term um but a lot of plants are um if the soil is dead plant's going to be dead right so uh, in terms of microbial uh, activity so if the soil has no microbial activity the plant will have none and so um, you can replenish that to one degree or another with compost tea. And it's actually more effective to replenish the, the endophytes in a, in a plant than it is to do it in a soil um, environment. And so that's why I've seen more uh, profound plant responses through foliar sprays of compost teas than soil applications of compost teas, although I have seen some good ones there too. Did that, was that, did that answer the question? I don't know. I think you covered it. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, let me see. Henry asks, should we be utilizing animals in soil crop improvement? I think, again, you're talking from the scale oh, of yeah, yeah. who you're normally dealing with. I, I would, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So so everything that I'm talking about here is 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 primarily dedicated towards uh, building uh, plants, right? So we're, we're dedicated towards building healthy plants. Um, animals will eat those healthy plants. So in whatever way, shape, or form, uh, that you can get animals into your rotation by all means. And a lot of situations, um, and I didn't really touch on this, but um, one of the crop inputs that we're soup that's just giving an insanely good plant response right now, Dan, is uh, uh, using animal byproducts uh, complex with bi uh, biochar and various forms of silicon and microbes, um, humics and carbonates and phosphates to, to actually create um, deliverable uh, pellets. So you're not just applying chicken manure. Right. And then salt, you know, you get great growth for three weeks and then salt spikes and then the drops off and then you have powdery mildew or whatever. It's it's a fully, fully buffered formulas, um, ready to go, um, high levels of available nutrients. And so that's a substitute. It's not the ideal scenario where you would actually have grazing because there's huge amounts of beneficial um, cellulase enzymes and other types of coenzymes that are um, that are actually present in the in the digestive tract of animals are huge ones and so um getting those back into the systems is a is a is a key layer although i have seen some odd flop inputs that actually are synthesized from you know that's essentially gut enzymes of cows and things like that that um that are really 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 powerful <laughs> yeah i think you talked about that pelletizing process and product and materials and <clears throat> you know, it it the, the 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 point here is really we can use the tools and techniques and and you know that we've whatever the machines were, whatever the application forms were of dry or prilled or foliars or or liquid and and a suite of biological materials that can have quite powerfully positive effects. So yeah, what I'm really describing is, is a, it's an update of technology, right? It's like yeah. a, it's going from a from a from a TV black and white on the thing that everybody gathers around, you know, in the 1980s to now everybody's real time phone, da, 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 right? So, so, you know, we're using manure. Yes. We're using animal bones. Yes. We're using blood. We're using, you know, plant extracts or, or, or uh, soybean meal or any of these things, but we're using them in a way that's guided by laboratory analysis that tells us where the limitations of that input were that we never knew before. And so for things that I didn't know for years, uh, that I was experiencing um, uh, have been elucidated with data. And now that allows us to make deeper and, and better decisions. And those decisions then spiral out. So we're not intending to replace nature. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're essentially taking nature and we're saying, look, we're going to cut some hardcore deals with you right now. Like real hard deals, right? Like humans have some issues. Like, all right, we can just they all just go away, right? And that's one option. But if we're going to continue to be on this planet and not yeah. continually poison ourselves, we need to take from history. We need to take from technology. We need to bring those together. 
And we need to do that in a way that fits all these different growing environments, all these different crops, all these different growers, all these different consumers, and, and then let technology sort all that out, really. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're not intending to depart from the traditional organic methods whatsoever. We're intending to essentially give them a fresh facelift and make them applicable on a scale that's previously um, uh, not realized. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. And I, I like one of the points you had made earlier about the about the plants. Um, I think maybe someone had, had mentioned it, but um, <clears throat> the amount of suffering that a lot of plants are experiencing, if you consider them to be sentient beings in the dominant uh -huh. production system, is quite extreme. And uh -huh. I've always made this point to vegetarians who whose argument for not eating meat is because they don't want animals to suffer or they don't like animals being in CAFOs or whatever else. I'm like, sure animals should have good, happy lives, you know, but how about your soybeans? They're effectively in a monoculture CAFO with no life around and, and, and how happy are they? And are, if they are in pain, what's that? And, you know, I don't know. It's just a, maybe a bit I mean, of a every plant's a prisoner, to, you what's know, that? to a degree. It, every plant's a prisoner, right? They can't escape. Uh, they, they can't run away, you know, they yeah. can't. And so, so they're, they, they're uh, methods and ways of adapting are completely uh, different than humans. You know, humans have fight or flight, right? Like we would fight or we would run. Um, and, well, you have neither of those options in the plant, right? You have self cannibalism or self consumption or, or, uh, or self harm rather. Um, and yeah. so, or or you can try to grow and, and and let it ride. I guess that's, and that's really what you see with these plants, right? And, and is, I mean, how many times have you seen a plant? It literally won't grow. Like it's out in the sun. 100%, it's just, 100%. Yeah, it's just in there. That plant is under significant stress and, yeah. it, and it wants to grow, right? But it, it's 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 like, no, I'm, I'm chill. I'm good. Like I'm not doing anything. I'm not giving in. I'm not giving back. I'm not taking. I'm just chilling, right? I'm just, just watching yeah. Netflix, taking my paycheck home and going, you know? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. sad that people don't um, think about how profound the plant kingdom is. And so if there was one thing I could say that Apical has done is we've we've definitely given folks a new way of interacting with their plants, no doubt. Um, it's yeah. it's very, very real. And and I don't think your reputation is anywhere near as well known around the planet as it should be. Maybe it's just your character and your nature and the way you're operating as such, but it really is extremely impressive. I, I'm sure I said that like three or four times already, but well, I appreciate yeah. that. And, um, you know, to your point, so a few things on that. So one, um, uh, you know, it's everything has been built from the ground up, right? So we have zero venture capital funding, zero, we sink almost no, no budget into marketing, um, just a couple of conferences and things like that per year. Everything we've done has been through word of mouth and successful customers telling, telling their friends and neighbors. Um, that's really been the whole the whole thing from from about almost going on eight or nine years now um so that's a piece uh the fact that i personally um am not the biggest fan of i don't do a lot of social media anyway and so it's just that kind of evolved that way but then the other bigger thing was that um we really wanted to make sure we got this right yeah. And so I didn't, re I, re I did very few public uh, talking engagements for 2022. Um, there was only a, a couple of local regional ones that I would do for, you know, a conservation district or a local organization or something like that. But really, I didn't speak uh, much publicly on any of this stuff until 2022. Um, part of that was COVID a little bit. Um, but uh, there was, I mean, I can probably count the number of conferences I did on one hand uh, before that. Um, and really talking in detail about about our work. Um, and part of that is, though, you know, our work has really evolved and picked up speed in the last four years. Um, the first four years, it was a lot of SAP testing, you know, what is this app and what is this? But um, now that we've really decided that we have the ability and resources to make a more comprehensive package um, for, for growers, um, that's uh, now, um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't I don't get out much. <laughs> haven't yet but yeah Not maybe yet. and 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 we're in no rush because you figured let's get the job done first before making some noise which i think is a good way I want to things done right i've seen uh, you know yeah. the, the companies i've worked for and, and have uh, worked with in the past i've seen them get out over their ski tips uh you know they tell their oh their customers all oh, were nutrient dense and 
Oh yeah, you are, huh? How do you know? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, 100%. Great. Well, we got f about five minutes left. Let's see. We can run through a couple of these questions that are remaining. Um, Aikau, do you use bricks at all? If not, why not? I uh, used to. I used to use bricks quite a bit. And I do think it's still of value to uh, small market farmers and, and folks in the field for, for rapid testing. Um, however, uh, we found that when we were doing uh, our brick and mortar SAP lab testing, we actually, for the first two years, we actually did bricks testing in our in our SAP lab. Um, we both we did it both for visual um, to get the fuzzy line when you have high calcium, and then we also did it uh, um, digital. And we found that there was a big difference between the way that the digital meter ray ran as well as the as the um, the, the visible meter, the refractometer. Um, and but the bigger issue that we found is we found um, crops with really high bricks. And that well, those were outliers um, between your your basic accepted theory around plant health and bricks. And when we found those, uh, we 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 said, all right, we need to look into this a bit more. And we found more and more and more like that. And and those um, essentially didn't obey the, the common thought of twelve bricks and above or what have you. Um, and so when we found those, um, what we did was we analyzed those through the full sap uh, testing. And we found that saline uh, and salinity. Uh, we're causing high bricks levels uh, abnormally. And so that the bricks was not able to differentiate from saline readings um, uh, in, in certain crops. And so what we were then in danger of doing, uh, knowing that information was providing uh, to our customer base um, uh, inconsistent or uh, in just not right, not correct results. And so we were faced with the, 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 the assessment. We said, well, we can either continue to offer bricks or we could uh, just implement something that is more consistent, which we did. And that was, that's total sugars, uh, which is extremely consistent. And um, it's the same thing as bricks in a way, but it's uh, slightly different number values, a lot lower, um, but it's pure sugars and it only picks up sugars. It doesn't pick up any, uh, any salinity or other dissolved solids. So there are some outliers where that the general accepted rule for bricks is incorrect. Right. Although in many cases you still think for small. I, I mean, so essentially, it depends on extraction. The, yeah, extra, extraction technique, crop, uh, the the time of day. There's just a lot of things that were just not not yeah. as consistent as we needed to be a to be a commercial laboratory doing that. So, for for so somebody hands on out in the field, it's great if you want a number, but you're taking it to a whole other level. Yeah. Yeah. What we're doing in this in the SAP lab is it's 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 a level up from from uh, Hariba and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Chris asks, "What is the silica carbonate reaction you mentioned, David?" Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good. Good. Good question. So, um, folks about probably heard about bicarbonates in in water, right? Well, there's uh, also bicarbonates in soil, right? And there's also silicon in soil, and those elements can either be more or less available depending, right? So when you think about carbon, when you think about bicarbonate, right? Or carbonate, CO3, C, well, three oxygens with a carbon, or HCO3, so hydrogen, carbon, and three oxygens, right? So what you're talking about is carbon that's that's been locked into place by oxygen, essentially. If you take silicon dioxide which also has unavailable oxygen and then you react silicon dioxide and bicarbonate together now all of a sudden you get you get potentially unpredictable reaction but the theory is that and well technically the way that it actually works out is you actually uh you add silicon dioxide to bicarbonates and you release carbon dioxide oxygen and you create a small rock and why is that relevant or important so it's really important when you're dealing in high bicarbonate environments, so either from the water or from the soil, high sil or low silicon environments, or some sort of uh, what have you, or say you've got uh, high, we'll call it sodium bicarbonate, right? Baking soda, tons of sodium in your in your in your cropping environment, tons of problems uh, because of sodium bicarbonate and sodium, and you got tons of white mold and all the other stuff that goes with it. Now you can then take silicon dioxide, apply it to your high bicarbonate situation, neutralize the bicarbonate, tie up the sodium, create a demobilized sodium silicate, which then is a rock, which the plant can't access. 
Once the plant can't access a sodium silicate rock, your sodium is demobilized and your soil salinity has been decreased. So um, that's one of the reasons. That's brilliant. I hope people follow what you just said. <clears throat> so, I mean, and the real point here is like, you know, I, I wrote down algae and ferments and foliars and, and, and campos teas and various people are, you know, like, we're taught about this product. We're taught about this technique. You know, foliar sprays are going to save the world. Um, cover crops are great. Um, <clears throat> when you actually know what's going on in your soil, which has been affected by humans in most cases for decades or centuries or millennia, um, and in most cases is worn and weathered and imbalanced. If you can begin to get a comprehensive assessment of that and then know what the systemic issues are to address those imbalances, oftentimes excesses of certain things, toxic levels of things, you can you can you can set a, a foundation to build from which is much stronger. And and just using the using the kitchen sink method or the you know follow the follow the the you know leader of the of the week or you know ism of the of the month or the decade um is not going to get you those results because every situation is unique and and we do have the capacity now with science to baseline that and be much, much more able to, um, you know, rapidly transition from worn, weathered, beat up, you know, low level life environments to vibrant, vigorous soil. That's that's what I'm hearing you say here. And I think it's a really, really important point. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Dan. Um, and and just to just to throw a real life example behind that last equation that I just unpacked for briefly. So um, a grower of ours in California that we're working with in stone fruit and a few other crops um, has been implementing these techniques. And so uh, when I first saw them or when I first met these folks, uh, they came up to me at a conference that I just spoke on sap testing and and they said, they said, that's all BS. So said, sap testing doesn't work. And I said, Hey, let's 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 dig in the, this a little bit more and let's <laughs> talk to you, right? And so he said, "Well, I've been doing sap testing for six years, and and I still have all these problems, and and uh, and I still have insects, I still got disease, I got all these other things." And I said, "Okay, well, let's let's talk through this. What what are your, you know, what are your levels of sodium and aluminum? Well, I never really looked at those. It's like, okay, well, you know, what are the, what are the the plants experiencing? He's like, oh, you know, stone fruit, you know, uh, bacterial canker and brown rot and fruit drop and small fruit and all these other things. And, and, you know, he's very, very serious because he was in danger of losing certain blocks in his operation to long-term systemic stress. Right. And so, so I said, okay, well, if you don't think sap testing works, and there's probably no reason for us to talk, but if you're interested and willing to, to give it a try, I, I would encourage you to send a couple uh, lab tests to us and we'll have a conversation shortly after. So we did. And it turns out, I mean, he, he was doing just what the sap test said, add more. Right. So he was adding more. Every single level on his sap test was pinned to the top of the top of the bars. And and I said, you know, I said, look, have you ever thought that you had too much fertilization? He's like, well, that's not how we've operated. And I said, okay, let's get your water, let's get your soil, let's do the whole thing. Well, it turns out the aluminum and the sodium were just driving everything. Well, essentially the sodium was driving poor plant health and susceptibility. And the aluminum was coming behind it to essentially just to take everything down completely once and for all. And, you know, he's talking, you know, I don't know how many more years these trees have left, you know, six months to a year, maybe two years, maybe one more crop. Okay, so get the assessment, start working on his excesses, drive those down through some of those um, techniques that I've, I've outlined, biochar, silicon, some of these others. And immediately he started to see uh, visual differences in his plants that, that he's, you know, he's, well, I don't know, I'm starting to see this, I can't tell. Okay, so about three months on the program late after that, I went to his farm and all these uh, trees that were dying from the top down due to aluminum stress and, and the associated uh, disease pressure were literally shooting new new shoots out. Yeah. They, had, they had healthier fruit on there than he, had, than he has had in over 10 years and bigger fruit than he's had in over 10 years. In addition, the other symptoms that that he was experiencing, chlorosis and, and um, you know, leaf cupping and leaf curl and some of these other things, aphid pressure was down 80%, you know, things like that. Um, all of that was extremely relevant to implementing a silicon and, and, and carbon buffering technologies onto their into their environment. So anyway, 
you can folks can discount all this stuff and that's great I, i'd encourage them to do so but if you're serious about regenerative agriculture a lot of these techniques are like i said at the beginning they're replicable you can study them you can track them um it's it's a lot of fun and, and uh when we have the, the tools and capabilities um that we didn't used to have it, it changes the paradigm really yeah does. i think really the world can be very different very rapidly if we <laughs> apply some of the things we know so it's, it's very, we scale? Very exciting. That's, that's, that's what the uh that's <laughs> what a lot of folks are asking nowadays is how quick can regenerative agriculture scale yeah so we'll see great well, thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure having you. Glad to have you on our stage. And My pleasure. Thanks for the invite. More, more people know about you and will continue to. It's really, really wonderful work. Thanks again, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> See you. All right. Talk soon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all the audience. Thanks again.